in the last two verses we discussed, Krishna gave us a hint how to attain liberation. He says, he said, yes, like summer and winter seasons, they come and go. Yes, yeah, so in the summer, you have to tolerate when, when it's too hot and in the winter it's too cold. Like yeah, this happiness and distress we experience through the body, we just have to tolerate that and not be disturbed. Because if we are become undisturbed in happiness and distress, then we are ready for liberation. And now after hearing that, uh, Arjun will hear from Krishna uh, the no knowledge related to the soul. That's important for us to understand who we really are, spirit soul, and what are the characteristics of our self. Because Arjun is very afraid that he will kill Bhishma Dev. That, uh, but who is Bhishma Dev? The body of the soul. Text 16. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Nasato Vityate Bhavo Nabhavo Vityate Sata Obeyora Padristantas Tvaniyostat Pradakshibi those who are seers of the truth who have concluded that of the non-existent the material body there is no endurance of the eternal the soul there is no change this they have concluded by studying the nature of both they means the tatva darshibi those who have seen the truth what's their conclusion their conclusion is what changes, that's the body, and what does not change is the soul. In other words, Krishna is saying to Arjun that Bhishma Dev and you, Arjun, are both eternal. Then why you are thinking that either of you will be destroyed? That is the effect, the, the, the defect in your knowledge, Arjun. This means, in simple terms, uh, those who are seers of the truth, the rishis, here called the Tattva Darshivi, they have concluded that things that don't exist eternally, if something does not exist eternally, it has no factual existence. And it will never exist. So they will never become eternal. Those things that are changing will never exist because they are always changing. So how can they exist when they are always changing? Those things that always exist, like the soul, never cease to exist. They are eternal and they all will always exist. So what is complicated to understand is quite simple to understand. The things that exist will always exist eternally. That, uh, so that which is eternal is, will always, always be eternal. And those things that, that, that don't exist, they will never exist because they are always changing. That's Nyaya in the Vedic uh, culture. It's called Nyaya logic. So one of the rules of logic is that only something that exists can produce something else that exists. From truth only comes truth. From falsity only falsity comes. So those things that exist will always exist. And those things that don't exist will never exist. Therefore, this body will never exist. 
it is always changing. So we see that picture in the Bhagavad Gita with all these bodies. That's like it's like a film. We see that it appears, but if we look at each frame of the film, we see that the body is actually changing position. Every day you look in the mirror and you think you think you see the same face, but something has changed. When we look at the at the film very fast, it appears that there is actual con continuity continuity in the body, but actually there is no connection within with one frame and the next. It is just our illusion that we see it as being one. So we say that the body is growing, but it is actually not growing. It is changing. That uh, every second it is changing. Every millisecond it is changing. So the same body that you are seeing right here at this second is a different body from what you are seeing right now. Every second, so many cells die, die and so many new are created, is continuously changed and there is no existing in it. So we think that the body exists, but actually it does not exist. This is the point here. Those things that actually do exist never change, and that is the soul. So the soul can never change, and it will always exist. And the body will never stay the same, and it will never exist. That is the point. To explain these two sides, that what exists will always exist, and that what doesn't exist will never exist. Now, the next two verses, Verse 17 and 18 are spoken. First, it speaks about those things that do exist. Text 17. That ah uh, vinasu that pipi fiti yena sarvamidam tatam vinasam apias yasna karnaka chitkartum arti. That which pervades the entire body, you should know to be in, indestructible. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. That, uh, the Purpose Shila Prabhupada explains that, yes, according to the Vedas, the spirit soul is one ten thousandth of the upper portion of a hair. The soul is eternal and cannot be destroyed. So the Papa describes how the soul is the size of one thousand of a tip of a hair, according to various shastras. That, uh, so the soul is immeasurable, you cannot count it. One cannot measure the soul, not by material means. It is not like uh, the soul uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a white, a white and a depth and a height. No, that it is sukshma, very small. So the statements of the Shastra, just to give an idea, even you cannot say that the soul is one, one ten thousandth of a tip of a hair, even that is a measurement. Because actually it is a sankito, transcendental to being counted, to measuring. Shiva Goswami mentions this point in his Sandarbas, just to give some idea how small it is. It is an inconceivable small unit. You cannot see even a tip of a hair and then divide it in 10,000 parts. You definitely can see it. You, you, you cannot see the soul within an electronic mi microscope. But even the small particles of the atom that the scientists known like 
protons, neutrons, they can actually be seen with a microscope, but they can only see the way they behave and how they cause other particles to move. It, it is only by anuman, or uh, anuman in Sanskrit means inference, by thinking, by reasoning, they, they, they one can establish these particles. So they can't actually see them with their eyes. So what to say of the soul, which is much smaller than the electrons or the proton or the neutron. They can't see the atom, it's too small. And the soul is inside of the atom. Actually, it is very small. Every atom, paramano, is inside. So uh, why would Govinda be inside the atom? That uh, why should it be inside the atom? Hmm. So, in the form of the super soul, the super soul's function is to accompany the individual jiva. So, why should it be there at all, all alone, without the jiva? The whole purpose of the, of the super soul is to be with the jiva. In the spiritual world, there is no super soul because there is no need. There is no need for guidance of prodding the soul to remember and surrender. So the Lord is there as a super soul, anantarastram paramanu, that uh, is inside the atom. And the jiva is also there, much smaller than the atom. They cannot see the spirit soul. If you cannot find the jiva, then how can you kill it? Prabhupada said at the, at the morning walk that there is a jiva in every atom. Just there are different levels of consciousness. We know that the mountains were also flying before. There is life in the rock. The jivas are in the rock. So the rock is also matter made of atoms. So what are the jiva and jivas doing there? So actually Sarvagata Krishna says in, the jiva is spread everywhere. We have the statement that the super soul is present in every atom. So what is he doing there? So even if you say that the soul is not there, the super soul is there. This means that the atom is spirit or that matter is also spiritual. So then if you think, why is he there? What is the purpose of the super soul being in some matter? The only function of the super soul is to guide the jivas. There are species of life and they reproduce, etc. They express themselves in various ways, but matter is not species of life. It is like a dormant state. It is dormant, hidden, crippled. A most crippled state for the jivas, unconscious. So what is spread all over the body? It's consciousness. It is pervading the body. The soul through consciousness pervades the body. The soul exists and nobody is able to destroy it. It's an imperishable soul. It is Shyam. It philosophically begins on the intellectual platform. It takes great realization. It takes attachment to realize. Then in the next verse, yeah, we can say this is ABC of spiritual life. The soul is eternal. It is pervading the body and does not actually, and the body, a body that actually does not exist. No, on one hand, the soul exists eternally and it is pervading a body which doesn't exist. That's the point made here. That uh, was the body has no consciousness. The consciousness comes from the soul now. Text 18. 
Anta vanta imedia nitya syukta saririna. Anashna pramayasya tasmat yutsyas pavarata. The material body of the indestructible, immeasurable and eternal living entity is sure to come to an end. Therefore, fight O descendant of Bharat. That, uh, so the previous verse described the spirit soul, and now in this verse, it's describing how the material body is destructible. So the soul is eternal, the body is destructible. It has to die sooner or later. So the body is always changing. It doesn't exist, it must die. The body must die. Krishna is telling Arjun, you don't want to fight in this battle because you want your relatives, Bhishma and Drona, all the rest. You, you don't want them to die. But you should know, Arjun. If you think they are soul, you should know that they will never die because they are eternal souls. If you think that the body, you should know that you cannot save them from dying because the very nature is that it is destructible, the body. It must die. That, uh, so therefore, you should fight. This is the message of this verse. Therefore, fight the descendants of Bharat, Krishna says. Because the body must come to an end. If, if, if you run from this battlefield, do you think you can stop Bhishma and Drona from, from, from dying? If you decide, I'm going to be living from Beijing, then Bhishma and Drona will not die. That, uh, so, are you that foolish to think that you don't think that if you don't take part in this battle, Bhishma will not die, Drona will not die, Duryodhana will not die, Dushashan will not die. How foolish. That is looking at it from the body's body point of view, thinking you are the body. That, uh, then looking, then, what, but once you look at it from the soul point of view, Arjun, Arjun, do you think you can actually kill them? Even if you put one million arrows into Bhishma's body and his body dies, then he leaves the body. But the eternal soul will not die. You cannot kill them. So either way, you should do your duty. Be here. We, we, we have heard in the previous verse that a person who is not disturbed by happiness and distress is studying in both. He does his duty in both. You cannot stop the body from dying. And you cannot make the soul die. Just simply do your duty. Therefore, fight for the descendant of Bharat. And in text 19, Yainam vitihantaram yasinam manyati hatam ubauta anavichani to nayam hanti nahanyate. Neither he who thinks the living entity the slayer, nor he who thinks it is, it is slain is in knowledge, for the self slain slays, no, no slays not, no is slain. Yeah. So neither he who thinks the living entity, the slayer, neither he who thinks it is slain, they are not in knowledge. For the self 
slays, slays not or is not slain or that uh, so fish fanatica bhakti taco says that the soul is neither object nor subject of the actual killing. That is the, ma the meaning of this verse. Sometimes the Buddhists, they are wondering what exactly is Krishna trying to say here? In other words, it cannot be killed and you cannot kill anyone. You are not subject or object of killing because it is impossible to kill. Krishna is telling Arjun, one who thinks that killing is happening does not know actually the truth. Those who criticize you for killing Bhishma are less intelligent. And therefore, why should you worry about one who is less intelligent? Because Arjuna is thinking, I do not want to be the slave of Bhishma. I do not want to be the one who, kill, who kills Bhishma Dev. So if, if you think that you are the one who is slain, you are the one who is killing, if you think that I will kill Bhishma, you are in illusion, Arjuna. Because Bhishma's body is not alive. So you cannot kill something that is not alive. The soul cannot be killed. So you cannot be the killer of Vishma. So don't think that you are the killer. Neither the subject can kill, nor can the object. Neither Vishma can be killed. So in either way, this is illusion. Don't think that the person that you are shooting with your arrows can be slain. That... Uh, do not think like that. If you think that, then that means that you have no knowledge. There is an example. This, so this is an example to, to, to help us understand this. Now, text 20. And text 20 is a very famous verse. Text 20 summarizes the old section here on the Hyam concerning the soul. That, uh, and that it's a very famous verse and you find nearly the same verse also in the Kata Upanishad, which Srila Papad quotes in the purple. So it's also in the Upanishad. Najayate mit permitjate pa kadachin ambut pa papitana pa na buyaha. Ioni kiasas for the yamburano na hanya te on yamane sariri. I read the translation. For the soul there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, will not come into being, is unborn, eternal, ever existent, and primeval. Is not slain when the body is slain. That, uh, so, text 20 further explains the point made in text 19. So, this is me. I'm the soul. I'm not born when the body is born. I do not die when the body dies. I'm not the body. I'm not white. I'm not European. I'm not male. That is not me. I'm not the one who possesses a boil on his nose. This all has to do with the body. It's not me. Due to the identification of the body, everything that happens to the body, I feel either pleasure or pain. Life means that due to the body, one must get some pleasure or pain. That's what, what we experience in life. We experience the body, the happiness and the distress through the body. That, uh, and there's so much suffering that, that comes to us 
And it's all due to identifying with this body. It's due to illusion, due to lack of knowledge. If we stop this illusion and stop acting as we are the body, acting just try to fill the body senses with different types of pleasure and trying to avoid all the pains the, as much as we can. If you act in this way, yes, we have to crack this illusion. Then we can be steady and very quickly perceived on the power of liberation. For the soul is neither birth nor death. At any time is not come into being. But we are in such an unfortunate condition when we are when we are just little babies, everyone looks at us and smiles. We look up and see big smiles in front of us, and, and they say to us, Oh, isn't he cute? And we start thinking, yes, oh, I'm cute. So look how happy they are, how cute I must be. <laughs> They are holding you and, and wrapping you in nice clothes. When you when you cry, everyone comes running and asks, what's wrong? Uh, immediately, from the uh, earliest age, we start identifying with that body. We look down, we see the legs, we see the arms, we see the chest, we see our toes. And we start from the earliest days thinking, yes, that's us. But we can't remember at any time when this wasn't us. It's so deep. But there was no time we were born. Thus, there is no time we can die. We have not come into being. We do not come into being. We will not come into being. No soul. Some religions think that when a body, a baby is born, the soul comes. But no, the when the body is slain, that uh, the text 21, that uh, Veda vina sinam nityam ya enam acham apyayam katam sapusa pakta kam katayati hanti hanti kam opat how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and immutable kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? In the purpose, Sri Papa writes, everything has its proper utility, and a man who is situated in complete knowledge know how and where to apply a thing for its proper utility. Similarly, violence has its utility, and how to apply violence rests with the person in knowledge. Although the justice of peace awards capital punishment to a person condemned for, mur for murder, the justice of peace cannot be blamed because he orders violence to another person according to the codes of justice. In the Manu Samhita, the law book for mankind, it is supported that a murderer should be condemned to death so that in his next life he will not have to suffer for the great sin he has committed. Therefore, the king's punishment for hanging a murderer is actually beneficial. Similarly, when Krishna's orders, orders fighting, it must be concluded, concluded that violence is for supreme that must follow the instruction, knowing well that such violence committed in, in the act of fighting for Krishna is not violence at all because of any rate 
the man or rather the soul cannot be killed. So for the administration of justice, so-called violence is permitted. A surgical operation is not meant to kill a patient, but to cure him. Therefore, the fighting to be executed by Arjun at the instruction of Krishna is with full knowledge and there is no possibility of sinful reaction. So it's like a doctor using a scalpel in a hospital. Krishna is ordering Arjun to become that instrument. But that kind of cutting is not violence. It's for the benefit of the patients, although there is some killing going on, but actually it's for the benefit for those persons who are inimical to the Lord and who are sinful and selfish like Duryodhan. He deserves to be killed and he should be killed. That is right, because sometimes people get very upset and say, what kind of God do you have? He's killing people and he created this war and so on and so forth. But if you look at the circumstances, then you see that the car more than deserved to be, more than deserved to be killed. And they should be killed for their activities. Not only that, Krishna and the Pandavas, they tolerated so many injustices for such a long time. And they still try to make peace and bargain with the Kauravas. But they were adamant and, and said, no, the Kauravas tried to kill them so many times. And besides, Krishna is the Supreme Lord who can give life. He's the one who gives life in the beginning of the creation. And it is his right to take it away when he, when he feels fit. Anyway, every day millions of people are being born on the earth and every day millions of people are dying. So God is the one who gives the life and he's taking it away. He decides, he decided, now these people will die and new people will be born. So this is just a change of dress. And Krishna is one who is the director of that to decide on what point we should die now. And that is all according to one's person's karma and his desires. So Krishna is not immoral. He's not an immoral God or an unethical God or a cruel God. He's quite merciful, kind and humble. He's coming to beg to you down, Pitarasta. Please let not have this war. And Krishna sent all his agents like Vyas, Matreya and Vidura and others to convince Dhritarashtra not to fight. And Duryodhan and Dhritarashtra were so attached to enjoying, to having their own kingdom and getting rid of the Pandavas that they were envious of the Pandavas. So there is nothing immoral of what's going on in Krishna's actions. Here in this verse also the word immutable is used. Immutable means that it cannot even change. It is what it is. The soul exists. It never changes. How can one who knows this, how can he think that he's killing anyone or cause anyone to kill? If one knows that the soul can never die, then there is the question of killing. It is only when we are in illusion that we identify with the body that there is death. So this is the platform of Yam knowledge. Both the Buddhists, Yogis, Paramavadis, they have all this common understanding that we are not the body, that we are eternal soul. And here is the example. Arjun starts thinking, okay, 
I accept and understand that the soul is eternal. So I will shoot my arrows at so many people. I will not kill anyone, but I will be the I will be the cause of changing their bodies. That is a fact, isn't it, Krishna? But Krishna tells Arjun, you cannot stop this change of bodies to occur, even if you don't take part in a battlefield. And Bhishma's change of bodies is just like that, like the change of a coat. So what is the problem? And that's explained in verse 22. Vasam shishirnani chata vyaya navani jinati na ruparani tata seirani vichaya jinani anjani samyati navana dehi As a person puts on garments, giving up old ones, the soul similarly accepts new material bodies, giving up the old and useless ones. So, so Arjun may think that, all right, granted that the soul does not die, still the bodies of Bhishma and others on the battlefield will be destroyed. That is wrong because I will deprive them from the happiness they derive from their bodies. And Arjun does not want to be the cause of their changing their bodies. So Krishna is just minimizing now the whole thing and by telling that the absolute truth is that the bodies are just like garments. No one laments when you change your clothes at the end of the day. So similarly, one should not uh, lament, especially you, Arjun, that Bhishma, Drona, and all the other relatives, they will change their bodies. So Prabhupada comments at the end of his purpose. He says, Arjuna is here by advice not to lament for the body change of his old grand grandfather and teacher. He should rather be happy to kill their bodies in the rightest fight so that they may be cleansed at once of all reactions from various body activities. One who lays down his life on the sacrificial altar or in the proper battlefield is at once cleansed of all body reactions and promoted to a higher status of life. So there was no cause of lamentation for Arjun. So Krishna here is using different analogies and different angles of saying the same thing to really drill in this point to Arjun that he fully gets the picture and is enlightened. So Krishna tells Arjun, don't worry. It's just like change of clothes. When old clothes are worn out and you throw them away, it's nothing more than that. Now, after this, Krishna is going to explain the qualities of the soul. And he will change the topic. Nainam chintanta shastrani nainam dati pavaka the soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon, no burn, no water, built by it. says, not by any weapon or chariot, chariot that uh, there are a lot of uh, weapons in his chariot that he got from different angles and so on. So, so he says, Krishna says, you cannot cut them with your sharp arrows, not by your sword. You cannot cut the soul, and the soul cannot be burned by fire, like by your angry sister, angry sister. And 
So, but are the various astras, the weapons of the Arjunas? Yes, the fire astra, the water astra. So the soul cannot be killed by your fire astra. The soul cannot be killed by the water astra that you have. Not by the wind astra, the fire astra. None of these weapons that you have, Arjun, can kill the soul. Don't worry about Drona, Vishmadev. And Arjun says that, but a burning house harms the living entities that are inside of the house. So won't the soul be harmed by harming the body? And Krishna says, no harm will come to the soul, even though the body is destroyed. No harm can come to the soul. Then he, he speaks this verse. So here Prabhupada is referring to the soldiers who are lying down their lives on the battlefield. The animal is not conscious doing that. It's also getting a new body and is elevated. So similarly, the warriors, they get elevation being killed on the battlefield. Besides, they like fighting, but it gives them, they are actually not afraid to die. It's like their religion, like a kshatriya. That's like going to church, going to the battlefield. It's like going to the temple. Like we lay down our bodies, paying dandavats, they lay down their body on the battlefield once and for all. Dandavats. They go up immediately. They go to Svarga. That is the general idea Mahabharata in the, and in the Karmakanda, in a lower level of religion. But it's still like a sacrifice. So in chapter 2, we have five sections that... Uh, so practically every year, yeah, these sections, they are not really defined, but yeah, like Bo example, we had uh, different ways to classify them and others had different ways that, uh, but it, it's basically the same, these classifications that, uh, so, at least, Bhujan Prabhu describes these sections of the second chapter in Surrendering to Me. That, uh, so, and there he writes from verse 1 to 10 Arjun's doubts. That, uh, then from 11 to 13 is called Ishyan. There is no death for the soul that it's describing Sankhya Yoga, that uh, so it's, so then, yeah, I think we, we can say from 16 till 39 that, that, that we read now, is, no, till 30, it's Sankhya, it's, there's no death for the soul. And then from 31 till 39, that's, we will discuss next lesson, the, that's Karma Kanda. That uh, fight by performing prescribed duties to gain material enjoyment, going to heaven and so on. And then from text 39 till 53, it's about Nishkam Karma, we will discuss. Fighting or acting without reaction. So, and then the last set section is, is called Samadhi, 50, 40, 72. That, so these are different sections that, uh, so we will continue with this section, which is still about Hyan or Sankhya Yoga. We are in the middle of the second section that, uh, yeah, so Arjun is in text 23, it's described that Arjun, you cannot kill the soul, 
with any of the weapons you have in your child. Not with your arrows, your sword, not with the wind, not with water weapons. The soul cannot be destroyed, destroyed by any of these things. So Bhishma and Drona change bodies. It's just like giving an, an, an old, worn out, useless garments and accepting new garments. That is what is going to happen. So what's the problem? After explaining that the soul of Bhishma and the soul of Drona and all the kings that are assembled there are eternal, Krishna continues to explain the qualities of the soul in a very analytical way. Again, this type of understanding on the Gyan platform is usually reached to analytical study. One is inactive and goes to the forest, not engaged in any activities whatsoever, and just fix himself. One does not want to engage one's body in any of the activities because one is trying to understand that one is not a body by directing his, his, his consciousness inside. While use, usually we are directing our conscious outside trying exactly to understand who is through intelligence and different practices. It is an inactive path because one gives up all activities to get realization on the Gyan platform. But the soul Krishna is telling Arjuna on the battlefield. And you have your arrows, your quiver, you have your different astras, you have your water weapons, you have your wind weapon, your fire weapon, so many different weapons, but you should know that the soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon. So if you are worrying that you are going to kill Bhishma, you should understand that your arrows cannot cut Bhishma because Bhishma is a soul. You, not, you cannot cut him. He's not a body, he's a soul. So the soul cannot be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor burned by fire. With your fire weapon, you cannot burn the soul. Your water weapon cannot moisten the soul. Your wind, wind weapon cannot bitter or dry up the soul. So this is the nature of the soul. It is existing et 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 eternally. And this is us. And this philosophy is presented in the first verses. After mentioning that the soul cannot be killed, he does not mention it again because even up to this day in the Vedic culture, even the villagers were uneducated and can't read, they understand that they are not a bodice, an eternal soul. This is the knowledge in the heritage of the Vedic culture. One who takes his birth in Bharat Varsa practically automatically attains this platform, which is even far beyond the realization of the greatest scientists of the world. They know so many things. They know how to make planes to go fast, but they don't know who they are. And therefore they are always in anxiety. They do not know where they are going. That is the most frightening thing. No, not knowing what is going to happen to us at the time of death. They are living as they are, they are their bodies and therefore they are committing so many abominable activities and everyone is making the same miscalculation which which is the same miscalculation that Arjun made is not accepting the eternality of the soul and so therefore the soul cannot be killed by any of Arjun's weapons so this is we are in the middle of this Yam section, which is important. We hear this knowledge. We have heard it again and again. But realizing is another thing. If we realize it, we don't suffer anymore in this world. We are always full of bliss. So that's process for realizing will, will be explained further. In the Bhagavad Gita. Any questions, comments?
Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, yeah, Maharaj, I was just wondering because in the Ishi Isha Panishad, Sri Prabhupada mentions about um kill, killing the soul, killer of the soul, Atmaha. Yeah. Just wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, of course, Atmaha, the killer of the soul. That uh, one cannot really kill the soul, but one can kill the awareness of one's soul. Mm. That uh, and that is a point made in Sears Upanishad. Mm. Yeah. When one performs sinful activities, especially, mm. it covers the soul. Avitam Jnanam Etana Jnanina Nichabarina. Yeah. Kamupena Kanti Adusprena Nalina Chan. So it covers one's knowledge of one's real self. And one act as one is the body then. Mm. And that's, that's like the, the soul is not there. That uh, they forget their, their own self in that sense. Mm. They, ki they kill their, themselves. And, and that's very lamentable. Most people of this world, they birth, they take birth, they have a whole life, and they die. And they didn't know who they are the whole life. They identified with the body. And that's great ignorance. Therefore, it's our duty to distribute this knowledge to help them out of compassion. It's a great act of, of compassion. And Krishna is very pleased with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's the Asma. Ask, yes, sure. Um, another question, Maharaj. Thank you for that. That uh, made it clear. Just wondering about when you said um, about the super soul accompanies the jiva and that's the primary purpose to accompany the jiva acting as sanctioner witness but when he, mm. krishna enters in each atom in in a in matter in inanimate objects what what is the purpose of him entering in each atom in the inanimate objects well krishna did not want to create this material world he did that because of the desires of the living entities, of the jivas. We, we, we learn on in the Bhagavatam, the creation starts with the glance of Mahavishnu, and he injects in the, in the unmanifested Brahman, he injects time and the living entities. And then the living entities, because of their desires to enjoy separately from Krishna, to enjoy Mother, the whole thing starts to move. And it's because of their desires that, that their false ego manifests, and that and the false ego combines with, with, um, with passion and creates intelligence, combines with with goodness and creates mind and combines with ignorance and uh, uh, creates the five basic uh, elements of material nature of air, ether, fire, and yeah, water. So, but it happens all because of the of the living entity who wants to enjoy separate from Krishna, who wants to enjoy Mother. And Krishna fulfills the desires of all living entities. He's a servant of all living entities. Therefore, he comes with us and he says, you want to enjoy, you want to play God? Okay, you forget, you forget that I'm God and you can enjoy in this material world. And, and, and I will create also the objects of your enjoyment. So he, he enters matter also. Mm. And, 
uh, for our enjoyment. That, uh, but at the same time, Krishna has arranged the situation as such that there is also suffering and he's calling us back, keep up that tendency. And therefore he comes personally and he therefore he speaks by Lord Gita and therefore he sends his representatives to get, uh, to get us back. That, uh, but that is Krishna, is the servant also of the conditioned souls. That uh, he, he arranges this material world for us. Krishna does not want it. There's no desire to create it. It's just because of us. Therefore, he, he, he organizes this material world and all this matter also. It's also Krishna. Mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That, that is the point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, interesting question. But, uh, any, anything else? Then we'll continue like next Tuesday. Krishna wants. Thank you very much. Hi, Krishna. Sorry for. Uh,